Uh, I'm going to ask Mort the, uh, the key question here, and that is, does this pose any immediate challenge to U.S. US, US interests? Sure it does. It's going to have a completely independent uh, source of huge amounts of capital that are basically focused on countries outside of the United States. And so we are going to lose some of the clout that we had uh, in the, all of these decisions, and in, not just in terms of lending, mm -hmm. but in terms of American investment and American opportunity. There's no doubt about it's it. It's a manifestation mm -hmm. of people that do not want to be so closely associated with the United States and the West anymore. The divergence has already taken place before they got together and called themselves BRICS. <laughs> Chinese and uh, Russia plan to take over the world order through BRICS. Uh, they, will believe, no, no. they will do anything. Russia, my belief is <laughs> that will, Russia no. has sought repeatedly to join, and difficult, to join the West, and we have virtually driven them back into the arms of China. Mm -hmm. What Nixon broke up, this recent presidents and administrations have put back together. How could BRICS have been averted? Well, uh, it could have been, a, 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 on one level, it can't, can't have been uh, uh, avoided because you have one institution making the decisions. That institution is dominated by the United States and by England, the traditional sort of Western capitalist countries. You know, it doesn't work for everybody now, okay? Yeah. They have different values, different ways mm -hmm. they want to uh, place their money and different ways they want to invest yeah, their money. Totally, it's totally uh, understandable that they would uh, link together and try to, and try to uh, give some pushback to the, to the West and show that their emerging co economies need, need to be treated like their world powers, which they are economically. economically. They also have much larger economies. Their econ economies have grown. Right. China's become yes. a huge force in all of this, right. and they're going to have a platform whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. From the environmental and labor regulations and all that they have to deal That's with. Right. That, right. That's so a big yeah. plus. For so the West has a fight the on its hands to maintain, yeah. the West yeah. has a fight on its hands to maintain the world order that you know, we currently have. Richard Nixon, I heard him once tell a foreign <laughs> minister, when you sup with the devil, bring a long spoon. <laughs> and that's what these fellas ought to do if they're dealing with the Chinese rather than the Americans. Issue three, a fair shake for salt. I have an admission to make. What's been written about me is true. Um, I love salt in my food. I put salt on my popcorn. As a matter of fact, popcorn without salt is not popcorn. And while this isn't the healthiest habit in the world, it's not as bad as it sounds. Former New York City now Mayor Michael Bloomberg can relax when it comes to his salt, salt shaker if a new study on low salt diets is true. During his tenure as mayor, Bloomberg was one of the country's leading anti-salt crusaders. Under his NSRI, National Salt Reduction Initiative, dozens of states and cities banded together to pressure major companies like Butterball, Hostess, Kraft, Starbucks, and Taco Bell to cut the salt added to food. The goal was to reduce the average American salt intake from 3,400 milligrams daily to the 1,500 to 2,300 milligrams advocated by noted health organizations. Now, a major study recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine says that those low levels of salt consumption recommended by the experts and the politicians are more likely to get this, kill you, than help you. That's right. Low salt intake can be lethal. The study tracked 100,000 people in 17 countries for three years. Those who consume the recommended levels of less than 3,000 milligrams per day had a 27% higher risk of death, heart attack, or stroke than those whose salt intake ranged between 3,000 and 6,000 milligrams. In other words, the average American's current salt intake of 3,400 milligrams is healthier than the low levels recommended by the American Heart Association, the World Health Organization, and the Food and Drug Administration. It turns out that Michael Bloomberg can have all the salt he wants on his food if this New England Journal of Medicine study is correct. Someone said to me, Bloomberg should have egg on his face. If you're going to become an activist and urge sweeping change, you should first be certain that the change you advocate is beneficial instead of detrimental. Who told you that? The well, salt industry? <laughs> <laughs> you think yeah, I'm I, in the pocket of the salt industry. I'm asking, John. I'm mean, just asking. Well, I mean, I don't really. Know their minds are. The Heart where Association, the, the FDA, et cetera. Where are the salt they, I'll go along with they their assessment. They were in Siberia, but I think they've all been closed down. <laughs> <laughs> are they in the um, are they in the uh, leader of the Senate's home district? It's, it's I mean uh, Nevada? Yeah. 
Not that I know of. There's there's uranium and stuff out there, I think. You, know. yeah, but that, you don't want to put uranium on your soup, I'll tell you that. No, I put uranium on your soup. I could either. <laughs> no, I, I, my, my father happened to have uh, high blood pressure and heart conditions, and everything. we grew up in a family without salt. Okay, I mean mm. literally. I mean, they, everybody said you had to cut it out. Mm. Now it doesn't mean that I have a good taste of food, but so far so good is all I can say. Yeah. None <laughs> of my uh, you know, siblings you throw out have had any difficulty, nor nor my sister. You can throw out every salt shaker that you have, and you absorb enough salt in processed food. They right. put salt in right. everything. Mm. And I must say, Pat's been invoking uh, Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon. <laughs> when Reagan was yeah. president, he once did an interview where he talked about the changes he'd made in his diet, and he said. Mm. He He'd given up salt. Yeah. He said, except for eggs. Yeah. He said, only a raccoon can eat an egg without salt. Every time I eat <laughs> no, eggs, Lawrence. put speaking, salt on okay, my hold on, Speaking of Reagan. Nixon, John, hold on, hold on. speaking of Nixon, let me tell you a little story. Very late in life, he was told by his doctor that he had to give up all drinking, and he called B.B. Rebozo, his friend. And B.B. said, sir, if I were you, I'd get a second opinion. <laughs> all these things cancel yeah. each other out. Right, right. Exactly. Uh, where did we read, if the salt <laughs> loses its savor, Wherewith will it be salted? It's the Bible. Shakespeare? No, oh, it's, it's, a, Bible? it's a New oh. Testament. Good heavens. Who said it? Oh, okay. Jesus himself. Who did he say it to? He said it to some Jewish fellows, I think. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> That's a good guess. That's a good uh, guess. I have to confess now, I was there, and it's exactly what he said. I couldn't agree with you. <laughs> Issue four, racial divide. This is the meaning of our liberty and our creed. Why? Men and women and children of every race and every faith can join in celebration across this magnificent mall. And why a man whose father less than 60 years ago might not have been served at a local restaurant can now stand before you to take a most sacred oath. When President Obama was inaugurated as the nation's 44th president in January 2009, nearly six years ago, it was a watershed moment in U.S. history. America had elected its first African-American president. And while President Obama has never claimed he would heal the racial divide in this country, to many there was a sense that progress had been made towards that goal. But a recent Politico poll shows that little has changed. Voters in battleground states, where there are the most competitive Senate and House races, say that when it comes to race relations in the U.S., from the time that Barack Obama took office in 2009, nearly half, get this, 46% say race relations have worsened since 2009. Only 6% of voters say relations have gotten better. And again, nearly half, 48%, say race relations have stayed the same. Among white voters, 49% say relations have worsened, while 4% say they are better. 47% say they have stayed the same. Among black voters, 38% race relations have worsened, 13% say better, and 47% they have stayed the same. Among Hispanic voters, 30% relations have worsened, 14% improved, 56% stayed the same. The poll was conducted in the wake of the events in Ferguson, Missouri, where a white policeman shot to death an unarmed black teenager, followed by riots and protests. Question, to what extent were these polling results influenced by last summer's events in Ferguson? Clarence. I think they, they may have been somewhat uh, affected, but I think, uh, I have a theory though that the reason why uh, a lot of people say that race relations have gotten worse is because they are, now have to think about them, <laughs> whereas they could have ignored them before and were ignoring them, uh, whereas since Barack Obama's election, uh, race has come up as an issue in politics as people wonder if, if Obama's opposition is predominantly racist, for example. I mean, those are questions they didn't ask about Bill Clinton and his opposition, even though it was about the same. But when you ask people about their personal lives, they'll tell you that their race relations are, are, are about the same or better because they get along with their neighbors or they get along with pe people at work or at school, uh, whatever. Uh, I think that the Ferguson incident affects people as far as their their national view, just like the O.J. Simpson verdict did back you, in the 90s. What do you pick up yourself from your own intuitions? 
uh, as far as race relations? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, since when I, I was a kid, we still had white and colored signs over the yeah. water fountains and restrooms. I think things have gotten, gotten a lot better since then. And I look at my son, who's 25 years old. He's, he's a millennial, and, and, and he's grown up in, in a multiracial, multicultural environment. Uh, and uh, their view of racism is different, but they, they are just as divided by race as far as their attitudes toward police. Talk about the younger generation. Did the election of uh, Barack Obama help uh, accelerate a convergence of the races, meaning uh, a reduction of anything like prejudice? I don't know if it accelerated it because, as I say, uh, we were doing pretty good already. We made a lot of progress since the 60s. Uh, but uh, after Obama's election, we began to see uh, a color cast to political divides. Brother John, uh, let me, more and let me more talk about this. You know. look, <coughs> look, you get African Americans are now mm -hmm. in, in law and entertainment and politics, public service. I mean, there are more black public employees or public leaders in Mississippi than any other state in the union elected. Mm -hmm. But the difference I see is what's happening worldwide, and we've talked about it with that Scottish issue. People are tending more to move into their own, Hispanics in their own communities and African Americans in their own community. They're separating and they're mm -hmm. seeing themselves as us versus them mm -hmm. more than I've seen as a community yeah, I don't see in that a good among while. Young, I don't yeah. see that among young people at all. That's I mean, right. I think, uh, yeah. you know, there, there, there's a, a, a lot of uh, inclusive, inclusivity if you want to use uh, that word. I mean they they do not see ethnic and racial barriers. I think with Pres President Obama I think that we, we congratulate our, ourselves as a nation that we elected a black president. Mm -hmm. I think everyone thought uh, or yeah. a lot of people thought that we were past a lot of our past uh, and, and, and we weren't and I think the black community sometimes thinks he hasn't done enough what? for them right. and there are some white people in this country who are offended just by the fact that a black man sits in the White House and those attitudes are not going to go away over a space of eight-year term. Yeah, I, I don't think that's the issue of Obama as you describe it. I think frankly there is a huge disappointment in his performance as president. Predictions, Pat. They will try to do something about inversions and corporate taxes in the lame duck session, but it will not succeed. Hello. Uh, the race for control of the Senate is coming down to so many tight races that we, re we won't know which party controls the Senate until December when Mary Landrieu in Louisiana will be in a runoff with her Republican challenger. Uh, watch for some more big announcements on private, uh, privatized space travel. Uh, it's becoming a, a, a growth industry in the private sector much faster than expected. Are you going to go up? I, uh, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I'm getting a little on in years, but I've always wanted to do it. What's your wife saying? Uh, she says, to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> to the moon, honey. Remember the honeymooners? <laughs> Why don't you say, right to the moon. Right to the moon. <laughs> Why don't you say, I've arranged for you to come with me. There you go. <laughs> Well, I think the Chinese are going to continue to grow as a major force in international business and international finance. And the story that we covered here is just one example of that. Uh, Obamacare was the death knell for the Democrats' control of the House in 2010. I predict that if the Democrats lose their Senate majority next month, the clamor among remaining Democrats in the House and the Senate to repeal Obamacare before the elections in 2016 will be deafening. Bye-bye.